All right, welcome everyone uh, to today's special Encore presentation of ITSM for Small Teams. Uh, if you had a chance to go to Educause last year, you may have caught this original, the original presentation. Um, it was such a big hit and I had to ask the panelists back here today and, and ask them if they wouldn't mind doing another presentation. And, and luckily they agreed. And unfortunately, we're missing uh, the third of the, of the presenters, Dan. Uh, but we have Karen and, and Sarah here to to more than make up for it. Um, you know, the, the presentation has been updated. Thank you, everyone who provided some feedback. Um, we, we thought that was very helpful. And it, I think it's reflected in today's presentation. And I just want to let you know, too, that regardless of your size, whether you're a large institution or a small institution, I think this, this message, this, this event is for everyone and you're going to get something out of it. Uh, my name is Mitch Pouse. If you don't know who I am, I'm the ITSM CG event coordinator, uh, bringing you these lovely events. And so let's take a look at our agenda. So today we have a real treat for you today. Uh, we have uh, our panelists. We have Karen Warren, Associate Vice President of Information Technology at Wesleyan University. Uh, she's also joined by Sarah M Murray. She's the IT Service Management Administrator at um, are you the, okay at uh, Bentley University? Sorry, I had to adjust because I had Daniel here in my in my script. Um, but I'll go ahead and let them tell tell you about themselves a little bit later. Presentation of today's format is going to consist of about forty or so minutes of presentation with time left over Q and A. We are asking that we that we hold off on the Q and A until the end. But please submit your questions in the Q and A panel. Um, Please use the chat window to converse among yourselves, uh, but use the Q&A to ask your questions of the panelists. If you do want to ask a question, please take yourself to take yourself off mute, raise your hand. I'll go ahead and take you off mute. And then when you're done asking the question, I would kindly ask that you put yourself back on mute. We do encourage you to chat with each other using the chat window. And as usual, the event is being recorded and will be available on the Educause ITSM website within five business days. Okay, well, without further ado, I'll hand it over to the panelists. Great, thanks, Mitch. So again, uh, Karen, I don't know, wanna in introduce yourself? Sure, absolutely. What I'm actually noticing right now, just for fun, is why my name is misspelled in my uh, Zoom box. <gasps> it is actually only one R. And so somehow my name is misspelled somewhere <laughs> up the chain. So there you go. Uh, I guess I'll submit a ticket on that one. Um, so, so I just noticed it now. It's kind of weird. So good afternoon, everybody. I'm Karen Warren. As, as was said, I'm Associate Vice President for Information Technology at Wesleyan University. Uh, I have a little slide on, on Wesleyan. I don't know, Sarah, if we want to just jump ahead to that, and then you can, can talk about yourself. Quick profile, just to level set for those who are in attendance and want to know. Wesleyan uh, is in Middletown, Connecticut. We're about two hours between New York and Boston. We are considered a, a small liberal arts university. Um, really small liberal arts colleges disagree with that and think that we're bigger than that, but we're definitely not big. I, for, for the sake of, uh, of this conversation with ITSM, we have 3,200 undergrads, as you can see, and about 1,100 faculty and staff. We're fully residential, and at the moment, we don't have any full-time ServiceNow staff. Um, and we have a kind of shared distributed model on, on IT service management that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Um, the platform that both Bentley and Wesleyan use is this ServiceNow. This is not a conversation specifically about ServiceNow, but because that's our platform, that will come up occasionally through there. So any of you who might be ServiceNow customers, I have people often ask me, like, what do we have licensed? So that just gives you an idea of... of um, how we are currently licensed in our environment. Um, that's probably going to be changing a little bit too, and I'll get to that later. Sarah. And I'm with Bentley University. Uh, we're in Waltham, Massachusetts, just miles outside of Boston, um, roughly 4,200 undergrad. Um, most of our campus population is on site. Um, I am the approximately one full-time ServiceNow staff at Bentley. Uh, we actually implemented a few years ago, and I started with ServiceNow when we started with ServiceNow. So um, our, the platform is managed out of IT client services. We'll get to that down the road. Uh, and there's our, our number of licenses, et cetera. So slightly different approaches to how we've implemented. But um, when Karen and I started talking, we got Dan involved in the conversation. Dan, I report up to Dan. Um, he's ultimately our, our ITSM sponsor, right? Um, 
we quickly realized that uh, a lot of folks would ask questions about um, isn't ITSM, isn't that a big lift for a smaller uh, IT organization? And we've actually found that it's been an enabler for us. So we're going to go through kind of the conversation that we've had with each other um, that is constantly evolving. A lot has changed even since we pre presented last fall. Um, but we'll start real quickly with where we were before we started formalizing ITSM, where we are now, and where we ultimately want to be. <laughs> So, with regards to the symphony analogy, where we were before, right, um, this should be a familiar story. We've heard it from lots of different folks. Um, managing service management using disparate systems, uh, each department or area um, organizational unit had their own way of managing service. Um, di different uh, communication uh, modes, right, and different understandings of what services we even offered, provided, supported. So leading up to our formalization of ITSM, and this happened again prior to my, um, my starting at Bentley, um, we were only worrying about incidents. We didn't have any, we didn't have any real processes. Um, there were processes, no consolidated processes behind um, major incident change. Um, our change man management process was very manual. Um, we had lots, we had major incidents were not an uncommon thing. Um, again, uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, um, little web content, right? We didn't have much for public facing knowledge. Um, there wasn't any real opportunity for um, self-support on our, for our client base and, and very, very siloed. Karen? Muted, Karen. If you're talking to me, Karen, hear you. Yeah. I was muted. <laughs> Sorry. My dog started barking. So you can tell how well this is going. But as Mitch pointed out, this is a free event, right? Uh, my apologies for that. And if I have to switch quickly to my headset, I will switch over there. Um, so we were in a very similar place. Um, I was there. I came on board as director of user and technical services. Um, and just as a as a kind of a quick set it, setting of our of our culture at the time, right? We we had an an open source ticket program that was used sort of. Um, it was sort of used if you wanted to. Um, we had proprietary homegrown inventory tracking um, and things were just kind of the wild west. We were very much, um, yeah, I've been in IT actually for quite a long time now, uh, much to my almost chagrin on some levels, but I have been, right? And it was very much a kind of early maturity organization and sort of typical for smaller organizations. Um, and I realize small is is relative, right? I mean, you know, we're talking about our our small organizations, and there are them there are some out there that are that are much smaller, you know, you know, ten or less people. Regardless of kind of how you're defining small, uh, in our environments, they are they tend to be very high touch and sort of a culture of, you know, we don't need all the kind of fancy systemic tracking, right? That, that's adding bureaucratic to our very kind of homegrown, comfortable uh, environment where we, you know, we don't, we don't need all those extra tools because it's just not that much. And what has happened, I think to all of us, regardless of our size, is just the sheer volume that we are responsible for because of the changes in technology. It is happening too fast. There's more and more on our plate and the, the breadth is so broad that being bogged down in the administrative nuances of just how to run your operation are more and more difficult. And you can't do them in email and Excel and you can't do them with you know tools that are not up to the mix. Uh, we hired a new CIO in 2012. Um, he had tasked me with, and I won't go into the whole, the whole story, but he had originally tasked me with saying, you know, hey, we need to get rid of that um, proprietary uh, inventory and that homegrown ticket, uh, the open source ticket thing. I want you to, I want you to find a solution that's going to, you know, marry those two things and deal with sort of incidents and inventory tracking. And I did start down that path, but as I went down that path, looking into that, I ended up coming into ServiceNow and realizing that we could take path A, which is what he specifically asked me to do, or path B which was gonna uh, was going to address the things that he asked me to do. However, it was also going to give us a path to a whole lot more. Um, and that's thankfully 
I thought well, that's what we should do. And he thought that's what we should do. And that's that's how we ended up getting on that road. Um, we started with some initial pain points and then we kind of went from there. So yeah, questions we were trying to answer and couldn't with those disparate systems, right? Again, a familiar story. Um, how do we coordinate, mitigate, recover from, prevent the next major incident? Um, how do we know who's using what systems where? How do we get away from this siloed approach to support? Um, yeah, uh, Karen, I don't know if you want to say any more. Oh, about... no, I do. Can, it, any, can yeah, you still yeah. hear me? I decided to make the switch yep. over here, so I hope <laughs> the folks can hear me. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, it, so part of the conversation I had with the, with the CIO was, you know, if if we want to start going down, you know, and, and, and codifying, say, our incident management and, and having a better sense of, of our inventory and what we had deployed out there, you know, it's going to start to lead to these questions that we're already starting to surface, you know. Um, the bigger questions and you know what what is involved in providing it services and how is that evolved like to what extent you know we we know that we can often be a cost center but actually what does that actually look like um how do we you know manage our inventory and our replacement cycles and how can we do this in a meaningful way uh, often for us one of our pain points has actually been the way that we we uh lacked any formal process around change management. Um, and while we were very, again, very ad hoc conversational about it, certainly there were meetings about it. Um, as we grew in complexity, there was less and less of a real understanding of how everything was interwoven together and how those dependencies were actually out there that ended up being sometimes unnecessarily affected um, by planned outages because we just lacked uh, a, a way of actually documenting how all those things work together. So these were things that we were sort of putting together as sort of long game questions, but how do you even start to think about that? So. So we both, go, go ahead, Karen. No, go ahead. All right. So both Bentley and Wesleyan in their own time came to this, we need a single space that everybody can be working, um, managing service, uh, receiving requests, handling incidents, documenting, you know, collecting data on the different things that we could. So, um, Karen. And this is where we deviate a little bit from the presentation. There was yeah. a survey that it went out to constituent group members. Um, of course, there's no, not necessarily a correlation between those who responded to the survey and those who are here. Hopefully, many and most of you are. Um, but but what we wanted to do is make sure that we were able to target this the best way that we could. Um, and so we asked folks kind of where they're at in their formalizing IT service management. And the vast majority of you out there have actually already implemented it. So we kind of sped through a little bit of sort of like how we got here, because most of you seem like you're already there, wherever there is, that there's something in place. Um, although there were, there were quite a few different answers in the process, as you can see, it's the vast majority there. Additionally, um, the next slide, there we go. We were asking folks about their pain points, and this is probably a little funky to read. It was, it's kind of a strange, <laughs> probably not the best. Those who are data vi visualization folks might be like, not the best choice. But what we were looking for here is what were the five people rated as five and four, like significant pain points in their environment? And what, what came out as kind of the, the leaders in that space? So ITSM staffing was one. Um, and I think there's some transitions here, Sarah, if you want to, yeah, uh, staff buy-in, governance. Um, these are the ones, it, it, they vary because you can see sort of the threes. The threes kind of was was sort of neutral. So a lot of threes sort of told us like, mm, we're doing okay, not necessarily considered a huge pain point right now. Um, a pain point, but without a doubt, right, the staffing uh, and the staff buy-in and the numbers on the bottom just re represent the raw the raw data. So you know, 19 respondents said that ITSM staffing was was a pretty high pain point. Um, 11 said that staff buy-in was, um, and 13 actually said that governance that that governance around it. And those are all um, those are all interwoven in there. I don't know if there's one more. 
animation if you want to yeah scoping was interesting but uh sorry about that scoping is interesting we are going to talk a little bit about that right Just keeping sort of trying to keep things on the rails with what you're doing with what you want to do with the project i think the short version is that by and large, right, there are a lot of pain points with this, um, but happily, the one that we're not going to spend time on, right, is the fact that we generally are not struggling with executive buy-in. Um, so there's a sense that the leadership understands that there's value here. Um, it's just pulling it all together. All right. So um, now that we have the product, we we got the product in-house at our initial initial. Um, project to implement uh, the, the major applications that we started with. The question was, how do we find the bandwidth? Remember that part of the uh, questions we couldn't answer is how do we get answers to those questions while remaining staff neutral? Um, as far as uh, the concerns about governance at Bentley, um, client services are uh, the unit that manages the help desk. Um, that is the unit where uh, ServiceNow was brought in. That's been an interesting, an interesting part of the story for us um, because uh, when we get down to issues of staff buy-in, um, we run into um, trouble sometimes. Struggle with folks seeing it as a, a full IT product or university product rather than the client services ticketing tool. Um, for Part of governance, um, we do make cross-function uh, team decisions, usually project groups when we're rolling something out, something new. Um, I lead as the, as the system administrator, uh, do have drop-in sessions, kind of like office hours, folks can stop in and ask questions, trying to build that um, understanding of what, what IT wants the tool to to make easier for them, as well as encouraging that staff buy-in. Um, I am the one full-time employee, but we do have we do have distributed roles at Bentley. So our change manager, our 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 IT help desk manager is also our change manager, our major incident manager, our incident manager, um, knowledge manager, our faculty staff tech manager also is our asset manager. Um, we do engage vendors for larger projects, and we're actually in the process now of looking at bringing in some um, hours just to take care of some of the low-hanging fruit, the little things on our timeline. So as part of our build, um, we implemented, just as a understanding of the, the time we've managed to make things happen, in 2019, middle of the year, we went live with incident knowledge, service portal, and hardware asset. The next year, we followed that with change management, management, problem management, and major incident management. Those two phases uh, were implementation partner phases. Since then, we've done um, built several service requests, consolidated two different ticketing systems. So our advancement team was using OS ticket on a desktop, uh, Windows 7 desktop underneath a desk in an office, and folks could submit tickets unless they were on campus or on VPN. Now that we've brought them into service now, excuse me, their folks can submit tickets from anywhere. They are using the service portal alongside IT. We've also brought in, um, we're able to discontinue uh, using JIRA as our uh, enterprise systems teams have come in and started using, doing a ticketing within service now. So Wesleyan has a slightly different timeline, some of the same trajectory. Go ahead, Karen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, some similar, but we actually went all the way back to 2014. So as I mentioned, it was in 2012, we started having that conversation. We went live with ServiceNow in 2014. And because of the pain points that we immediately had, um, we started with incident management, but we were very quickly talking about um, CMDB and hardware and software asset management. I'm going to qualify that a little bit now. Um, in uh, Hardware asset management uh, definitely was a, was a was a thing that we needed to deal with immediately. Software asset management is a, it's not fully developed. What what I mean by that, um, and so just to level set our, our conversation was um, an understanding of what is involved where, but we are not managing our license. Um, we're not controlling uh, compliance. We're not controlling software compliance through the software asset management, which there is a whole, 
pro version of the software asset management tool that can do that. So I don't want to, I don't want to be misleading there. However, again, it was the visibility issue. We really had no visibility with these things before. Um, and we needed, we needed to know what we had. We needed to have deduplication. We need, we needed to be able to ingest kind of all, all of that stuff in order to be, start to build that foundation. Starting with CMDB is a little strange. Um, but when, if you connect that back to one of the earlier things I said, where we started talking about dependencies, that's why the CMDB beginning early on to develop that, or kind of in parallel with everything else, why that became an issue, because that is the place where we kind of look where all these things sort of come together. So there's never a finished with a, a CMDB, but that is something that we've had in our mind and continued to develop moving forward. The CMDB team concept is something I'm going to talk a little bit more about. I call them that because initially that's what that group started as, um, and we've still kind of called ourselves that. However, um, that group still exists. We still meet regularly, and that's where a lot of decisions are made. I'm going to get to that in the next slide. And then as we progress forward, it's not that nothing was happening in those intervening years, but there was a lot of um, development and use. And again, it, it, you know, when you don't have the dedicated staff, you're not, you're not turning things out at the same pace as when you have like, even if, if, if in our environment, we had a Sarah, um, we, we can't necessarily turn the number of things out. However, we started to get a lot more intentional as things rolled along into, um, uh, 2020, um, not coincidentally, when some other things slowed down, we were able to ramp some other things up, even though there was the craziness of the pandemic. Certain aspects of daily life changed in busyness. And so we started um, getting more, uh, looking more towards what we can do and to continue to mature our own processes. Um, so, um, so anyway, I'm sorry, I just saw a thing in the chat there about about the music. And I think, I don't know if the music is actually coming out too loud. So I wanted to kind of mention that. Just I don't know if we should skip that, Sarah. But I hope that I'm not too loud. That's the, one of the things I was trying to try to get here. Um, anyway, so as we move towards, you know, again, maturing what we were building on. And I think that is that is ultimately the goal. Sarah, if we can go to the next slide. Yep. So Again, speaking to some of the issues, the, the governance issue, right? So in this case, it started as, as, a, as a project that was myself and the CIO deciding that this was a path that we were gonna go down. So it never started in client services. We started with it being an ITS initiative. Now, that doesn't mean that everything affected everyone day one, it did not. You know, We've continued to build and develop along the way. In fact, many of our enterprise systems folks didn't come onto it for for quite a while, they had it. They had other ways they were managing their work, um, and it it took it took some some talking and deciding about how that would work. But the the tone and the expectation was set right off the bat that this is an IT this is an IT solution, and the idea of it is sort of a single source of truth to the best that we can get at. As I'm sure that there are, there are some Wesleyan folks on the call uh, who will be happy to dispute me on, on certain matters. The, the point is that actually, this is where we look to, this is where we have to correct where things aren't, if things aren't correct, right? Be looking at our data sources, figuring out why, looking at our processes and how it's working. And that's as, that's where it needs to get solved. The cross-functional team I refer to as my CMDB team has really evolved into my sort of ServiceNow team. What that means is, so cross-functional from each area of information technology, we make decisions about how we are going to use the platform and standardize on those decisions. And that can be the reason it started as CMDB team is there were a lot of conversations around, um, around classes and how that we were going to define the more abstract things in our configuration management database. Meaning that stuff that's not coming in as computers and endpoints and switches and all of that, which is is classed pretty straightforward. But when you're talking about things that are getting kind of created and in, into the, the system and what we wanted to define as services and how we wanted to create out the dependencies and parent services, we made those decisions as a group. And we continue to make them. 
and we have them where we're discussing, should this get added in? We're going to start doing this. In fact, this was a conversation we've had very recently. Does that mean that we need to be, um, you know, what? how does that impact what we do and how we're going to track it? That's what that team does. So they're making significant decisions and they're constantly a sounding board um, so that we can find out how is it going to be of best use to the whole team and it becomes a feedback loop. We also have an ongoing partnership with our vendor. They were our initial implementation partner. Um, they were acquired somewhere along the way by a bigger one, but it's still the same team that we work with. Um, and I definitely work with them. It's there. It's shared a lot. I've done some of my own development. There may be some of you who are like, well, that's a little weird because you're an associate vice president. And I'm not going to deny the fact that it is a little weird. <laughs> um, and it's not ideal all the time. There are times that I've done aspects of it. Oftentimes it's a shared thing. I go to them and I say, we want to build this. Um, but rather than making it a, you know, a, a crazy expenditure, a way to control expenditure as they build up to a certain point, or I build up to a certain point and say, I need you to take it from here because I can't do X. There are things I don't work in. I don't work in, in, you know, sort of the portal representation. Um, and they do that, but it's a lot more sharing. It's not um, necessarily just a handoff. Uh, but it also means slower rollouts. I want to be honest about that. There are things that have taken a long time that other organizations with more staff might have been able to implement a little more quickly. Um, staff buy-in. The cross-functional team has been important that because it's people from different areas of information technology, I really rely on them to be the enthusiasts with their area. So where they have the, 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 the naysayers or the folks that are sort of, you know, eye rolling or how is this going to work, I really rely on them and their help. And I also rely on them to help with, hey, can you spend time with this person who's new here, explain how this works and how I'm expecting this to kind of look in, in, in service now, or, hey, this is how we want them to build out the dependency, or this is how we're collecting data for that, whatever the case may be, so that it is also a distributed way of actually sharing knowledge. Um, and so, Leadership, the leadership team, again, that kind of top level buy in, the leadership team also has expectations of their teams. So uh, that makes a difference, right? And so I have people to go to um, that are in the respective director, um, executive director levels to say, what do you want to get from this? Where can we go from here? And let's work on this. So those are how we address things uh, in order to do that. Um, it does result in some more people having knowledge about the system um, at the same, and, and it does also result in things being a little bit slower. So Sarah, next slide. Do you want All right, <laughs> yes, sorry, skip the music. Um, so once we got past implementing the tool, we started to build the platform out, right? We are now, um, we have lots of conversations about this between Karen, Dan, and I, that we are now at a place where we're expanding internal adoption, growing an audience, and that uh, audience is in IT and outside of IT. Um, it is, I find it interesting, this is the image that we chose, um, simply because this is a pandemic performance. You're starting to see the symphony fill in, right? Folks are, are coming back to performances. Um, the timing for Bentley to start formalizing really within a single tool, our IT service management uh, allowed us to pivot for the pandemic in ways that we would not have been able to do just a year before. So our current initiatives right now, we're in the process of replacing what we've had to this point is essentially a request catalog. Um, we are in the middle of a project now to formalize that as a, as a true service catalog. That's the, in the bullet two, right? It's the migration to employee center. Um, because we have some of our assets loaded into ServiceNow, it, albeit a very manual way, um, we're now working on the Tenable, an integration with Tenable with our cybersecurity team so that we can update those some of those assets um, in an automated way. Uh, we've built and launched a, our first second scoped app, a um, little behind Wesleyan in the scoped app space, even though we're well ahead in the, the service request space. Um, built a cybersecurity incident uh, reporting um, scoped app, lots of service requests, and we're starting to see um, service requests 
as the buy-in grows, as people hear about ServiceNow and get excited, even about the things that we can do, the, the data we can tie together now, right? The communications, because it's a communication tool, um, that we are now getting requests from outside of IT. Hey, can, can the platform do this um, to help us manage this problem because we're seeing IT succeeding and handling this in, an, in a new way? And that sets me up well, actually, I'll, I'll tee up these things, but um, I didn't spend a lot of time on the scoped applications when we were looking at the timeline slide, but that is an area that has actually evolved for us quite a bit as we have had departments external from IT come to us now. So one of the parts that's tricky, right? And I think that, um, and we we definitely had some folks ask us about this that at Educause is that some of the things that we're looking at and trying to do, it's not that there aren't modules that you can add in. And, uh, and if you're a ServiceNow customer, you know that there are modules aplenty. Um, and I would imagine many of the other platforms actually operate very similarly. So I don't think that's unique. And it, it becomes a cost optimization decision. It becomes a, well, if we, we could do this and deploy this whole module, what does the whole module entail versus exactly the thing that we're trying to get out of it? What's the problem that we're trying to solve? What is the cost benefit analysis there? Um, and we've done a lot of that. So the, the folks that have come to, to ITS that are other departments, are often coming, they're, they're small, generally administrative areas, although that has started to change a little bit. Um, but where there are offices where they're managing things and they've largely been managing it over email, that, that has been the biggest issue. And they just need to basically break the email issue because they can't, they themselves are also overwhelmed because their own tasks. And for us, that ended up being um, our, our AP and accounting groups who um, had several email addresses, you know, and that's kind of how they were funneling work between each kind of these groups of email addresses. And it was not sustainable. And they had hired somebody new in who said, hey, uh, I see how you're doing this in information technology. Is this just for you? Uh, I'm like, no, let's talk. And then that ended up happening um, for a couple of other groups who had the exact same problem and said, you know, our payroll group, which is a separate group, same problem, right? How do we, we aren't doing this. We're, we know we're losing work. We know things aren't happening. And of course it also resulted in them getting reports and data. Um, and it's also incredibly validating because the more value that the entire institution is deriving from the platform, the better it is for us. And the likelihood it is for us to be able to continue to invest resources in it. Um, Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. And, uh, and so, um, so, uh, so we, we have been doing things with scoped applications because the level of complexity in those applications is very low, but this level of satisfaction is extremely high because what they were trying to accomplish um, was well within what we could actually do within what we had already licensed within ServiceNow. What we have really in the hopper right now, actually about to come out, uh, is this onboarding for, for new hire. Um, that has been a long journey. We've been working on this for a while. Um, Sarah already mentioned the fact that we have not been great with request. So early on in the process, I used to talk about this with some of my uh, other higher ed colleagues because the request module, for lack of a better word, in the ServiceNow space, which might not be true in some of some of these other platforms, um, has a lot of layers. And in higher ed, right, it was sort of like, okay, it's going to be the same person that's going to address that that and that task and and all the way down the chain. And so there was a lot of kind of a perceived overhead around it. And when we were trying to solve a lot of problems, we ended up kind of stuffing requests in other places. So far, not best practice. Absolutely not. Uh, I would not be the person to say, hey, that's the way to do it. But it was sort of the way we had to get out of the gate. We're now trying to backtrack a little bit and build things out into, into requests. Um, and I, I mentioned that here because uh, the onboarding for faculty and staff has actually got quite a bit of uh, it, it's somewhat complex flow. It's a it's it's an order guide with multiple requests embedded in it and multiple different flows. And we're going to give it a shot. And I have my fingers crossed because it's been a pain point across the institution for quite some time. 
So I'm hoping that that's exactly going to happen. Um, and another, most of these things that you see here, a lot of them are uh, request based because we want to build them out correctly. Um, we're going to allow um, our faculty and staff to sort of place an order for their replacement computer when it's due. But it's not like Amazon, and so we have to also create the culture to say you're ordering it, but it's not really different. You're just entering it into the system, but you still has to be approved in all the same ways. Um, so it's not a wide open order thing in case some of you are wondering about that. Um, and I've also had some student areas actually come to me and that has increased. Um, we actually did something for residential life who were kind of dealing with things through email. Um, quite a bit as a matter of a fact. And our Student Resource Center and our actual snail mail, our post office um, came to us and, and that is out there. So that has led to my last bullet, which is that with more and more student facing stuff, um, I really got to get our, our our mobile application and, um, and nothing fancy. I want it to be fairly straightforward out of the box with, you know, um, some modifications in terms of, of appearance, but uh, I'm not going crazy there, but you know, uh, we we know obviously that's how our students engage. Um, and so I, in order to make these things more useful to them, the mobile is definitely on my horizon there. Okay, now we so have So this to... is where we're, yeah, this is where we're currently at, right? Um, but always looking forward. So since we already got a preview, where we want to be, right? Complete visibility into the provision of all those services that the folks in our client base are looking for, right? Our students, faculty, staff. Um, this is when the symphony, every, every seat in the symphony is filled. All of the audience is there. We're playing to a, a performance that folks really want to hear, right? Fighting this, the good versus evil. We're all fighting against a common whatever that thing is, right? Um, sharing in the same story, same experience. We're not there, that's where we wanna be. Some of what we, um, I wanna bring it back a little bit, Karen, to scale when we talk, cause you you kind of mentioned this a little bit, um, talking about the, the tools, ITSM, man, IT service management tools are really designed for massive organizations, right? That's a, a conversation we've had in lots of different spaces. So when I mentioned earlier that our incident manager, our help desk, our help desk manager is our incident, our knowledge, our um, change manager, all of these things. There is some adaptation that we have to do within the tool to make it work. However, that's worth the benefits we've seen from getting everybody working in the same space together and formal using the tool to guide the formalization of those processes, right? So for Bentley, now that we have um, the, our incident, we started with incident. Everything was an incident. We've had to do some of that undoing Karen talked about where now we're having to coach people, coach our, our folks that not everything is an incident, something that's broken right now. We need to move that to a different space so we can handle those things a little differently. But since we have, we started with incident, we started with knowledge. We're three years into creating knowledge-based articles. It's been a big push for us to populate that knowledge the content that's out in our self-service space, right? So now on our roadmap, those things have set us up for not so much CMDB, that's a separate wish list item. But if we, um, once we get through the employee center set up so that we have a true service catalog, once that's all the groundwork needed for us to bring in virtual agent um, to get set up, we're looking at Teams integration. Uh, with Employee Center, going to be super exciting. Um, we have previewed things like the cybersecurity module. We're kind of taking that crawl, walk, run approach where we built a scoped app for cybersecurity. We'll see how it goes. That'll buy us some time to get adoption once folks are in the platform and start to use it. Then we'll see, okay, so I wish we could do this with it and then reevaluate whether or not we want to move towards the cybersecurity module. But there's a lot of space in between what we have basic out of the box with the tool and having to add to it. Um, we're looking at finding ways to track, you know, the help desk gets calls for everything. We are an IT help desk and we do a lot of routing to other departments, but folks call because we pick up the phone and we answer and we say, how can we help you? So how do we track and report on those things? Um, and we are because I've been able to do quite a few things, but I can't do all of it. And as 
as interest grows, right? There's a lot of things folks want now from the platform, which is really exciting, but we are having to look at growing uh, beyond our implementation partners now having some kind of staff augmentation to handle the little stuff because the the to do list is getting getting big. Um, I like how you were you had said something specific. I like when you talked about it 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 helps to codify and develop process. I mean, there's a couple of things. I mean, obviously, a lot of things I probably jumped over quickly. I mean, one of them for us was change management. Um, that was somewhere it was supposed to be somewhere in the timeline that that I had up there before. Um, but you know, as I mentioned, we had once we we actually started using change management within ServiceNow, we actually just took it out of the box because our own processes were so lacking um, in any formality. And again, it was there was that tension right between the oh come on, why do we have to formalize this? We've been fine, and having to say well actually, there are places we haven't been fine. <laughs> Um, and it's kind of annoying to sort of sometimes be in that role, but pointing out where, but if we did these things and understood them, then this wouldn't happen kind of thing, whether that is an unintentional, as I already mentioned, unintentional dependency. Oh, that was an outage. You know, we had egg on our face a couple of times over probably what shouldn't have had happen. And now we started to develop that and say, okay. And some of that, again, was around the language of, of, of understanding what a change is and why we're documenting it, where we're documenting it. Um, so we started putting that in. And one of the things that I think about as I think about the entire thing is the fact that it's a system to work within that doesn't just belong to people who do the service now stuff. It belongs to everyone because there's a function of it. There's a piece of it that is a part of what you're doing for your job. And for some people, that piece is much bigger than other people, depending on their role, right? It really depends. But but there is some role in there, whether, whether you largely are managing kind of changes, whether you are having to periodically review services and, and applications and how they're defined in there and, and are the functional owners still on campus and whatever, the, you know, whatever that case may be. Um, certainly our, our frontline support people are in it, you know, on a, I mean, they live in it in a different way, but it's there for everybody. And it's not um, trying to keep and maintain that culture of that there's a part of this that I own that I'm accountable for, not the whole thing, but here's the piece that I own. And then also continuing to build up the, why should I care about this? And one of the things that I also skipped over quickly was, was really dabbling in the last year and a half to two years around with performance analytics. And, um, and that was actually enabling us to start to really get some data and, and to, to start to figure out what we were looking at and what, what was actually the result. And once that started happening and people could kind of see it, it was a lot easier to draw that line all the way down, even going back from the inception to now to say, I know. So remember way back when I said we wanted to start this and then we do this and this, that's because we were building the path up to here to be able to build out and get that data so that I have graphs now around services and the amount of changes happening for certain services and why. Um, and then a quick, you know, our roadmap wish list here, I, I already mentioned the request issue, um, as you can see. Another project that's on immediately on my roadmap is going to be, I have a third party tool I've been working with for many years back when, when particular service now didn't do some, um, didn't really have options around normalization for handling hardware. All of that is now native in service now. Um, and I'm going to be moving to their hardware, excuse me, their hardware uh, asset management pro module, and I will be retiring the third party solution. Uh, and that will be happening. And then I have, you know, hiring an FTE question mark. So now building the case, I have so many different um, external areas. And the fact that the CIO often leads the conversations with the with the rest of the cabinet campus leaders, where they're talking about KPIs across the cabinet in the respective areas, he's able to have that conversation, oftentimes is able to lead and talk about that conversation and showing how how we're doing those things and how we think about those things. So that is that has had a result of upping our game quite a bit from the immature organization in 2013 that was kind of using open source and where you couldn't really follow up on an email quite the way we wanted to, to where we're having much broader conversations. And it sounds all glossy, 
but I also am going to acknowledge it's definitely not easy and it doesn't all work perfectly, but I don't need perfect, right? I just need us to be invested in the fact that this is our source of information. So and, we're about to come up to questions. it all together across units, right? Yes, actually. And there's a question in here. So I do want to get to that because I know we're kind of heading into the question time here. Um, so somebody said, are other departments clamoring to use ServiceNow? Have you or do you plan to build a separate space for them within the tool? So I'll answer for me and then I can, and then Sarah can answer for Bentley. So there's there's two different answers there. So So there has been some clamoring that has come up in the areas that I mentioned and that I've been able to do thus far within the scoped applications with, with how I'm licensed right now. We have also had conversations and those haven't happened yet on sort of bigger initiatives. Um, more than once our organization has talked about whether or not we needed to look at the HR module. We haven't, we, we talk, it, it goes up and down in priorities depending on things, but that's that's there. Um, at this point, we don't have our facilities group in there. We don't know whether or not that's going to be a non-starter for the conversation. Uh, I'd love to have that happen, but I don't want to be also seen as shilling for service now. Um, so right now, um, scoped applications are somewhat broken out, and I use some access control in order to to, to manage that. Um, but it is all still in the same instance, Sarah. Yeah, so we're using a single instance um, and worked with an implementation partner early to create record separation. So our advancement folks are using the same tools that we are in ServiceNow. They're working through the service catalog. They're on both the client's facing side and uh, the fulfiller side. It does use fulfiller licenses, but it's the same ITIL licenses. We just have roles that separate so, they, so that we're not um, sifting through each other's records within the system. All right. Um, some questions, some really good questions are coming in. And so David asks, and I'm going to read this because this is, this is strikes at the heart of things, I think. As a small IT team, we feel overwhelmed by the growing complexity of ServiceNow and the strong push in the product towards an enterprise service management model with the universal request, employee center, et cetera. Could you use ServiceNow effectively without partners handling some of your project work or operations? Does committing to ServiceNow mean committing to a partner budget and growing and growth beyond IT. So I'm going to answer from my perspective, um, and it's a really good question. And on some level, I'm going to say, I know what you mean. Um, and this probably, it, we could we could probably substitute service now for a lot of products out there, right? And not, and not just blame them. But sometimes I want to say, hey, don't forget about what you do and did best and why some of us started with you in the first place and don't leave us in the dust. So. My answer to that question is that, uh, first of all, I have a service portal that I'm, I know Sarah doesn't really have one and she's like gonna start with Employee Center and I have the service portal. And that was one of my early questions, which is, are you making me ditch this? Well, no, okay, good, thank you. Cause I'm not doing that now. That's like not on my horizon right now. Um, will it eventually become well probably sure like with most of our products we end up having to, to phase things in but immediately um don't don't throw that out before that i've been on service now so long before the portal existed there was something called uh i forget what it was called ess something like employee something whatever it it's not the the service center it was the thing before that right what i try to look at service now is doing is not eating you know it can look ridiculous. And sometimes I look at my, you know, my nav bar in the kind of whole entire world and say, you know, we live in this part of this world. And so I continue to get benefit out of the flexibility of being able to manage and configure service now to do what we want to do, but that's configuring and not customizing. Do I think you can do it without a partner? I don't I will not tell you what my partner budget is, but I know it's a lot lower than what you probably think it is because I I kind of keep them on a retainer sort of hours basis thing, but not this mega megalithic thing. And so, and then we share and distribute work back and forth. I feel like I need them for that. But if I had people on staff that I would be like, hey, go to the community, go do this, go do this, that we're doing it, I 
I, that could be managed. So I don't know that I could say, hey, you never need any partner at all. I think that there are times when you can use them, but I also, uh, I'm right now in the middle of, of navigating that space of how I'm going to be managing, uh, implement, um, implementing something and knowing that they're gonna come in with this implementation cost and that I'm gonna go back and forth with them and say, that's not what we're paying because that's not how this is gonna happen. I need it to happen this way. So there's a little overhead work there. Go and ahead, Karen, there, there is a, it is a There is a layer here that's about um, complexity, right? A lot of those modules that you have to tack on the, the big um, additions to basic ITSM in, in ServiceNow, right? They may seem great, it can do almost everything for us, but what do we really need? We just yeah. need to place the log tickets for this particular thing, or we need to right. track this data, so we need to collect this data. So there are opportunities where you can build something in-house that will work, right, to get you started. And then proof of concept down the road could look at that future investment. Absolutely. So the example on the onboarding, right, that's a good one, because this is where HR, should we do HR, should we not do HR? And that's that's actually a big institutional question like I, I don't I can't lead or control that um, and so when they decided not to they're like well how can you help us bridge the gap and, and solve this problem and that's when we completely looked at it differently now that's not a scope application but I'm still living in IT service management I still am and so um, same thing with the scoped applications just echoing what Sarah just said right I mean, yes, I could, and I'm not not selling these things, but if you go into ServiceNow feeling like, oh my God, I got to buy finance and I got to buy HR and I got to do all this, then it feels like, forget it, there's no way I can manage in this tool, but it's actually not true. And I think that there are ways to manage it. I think internet two pricing is critical and, and I'm still grateful and I always feel like I have to do the shout out to internet two for negotiating that pricing because it's critical for us to effectively to be able to do what we wanna do within the modules that we're doing them, right? To have the users that we need to be able to do, to have our student users to be able to do them um, and, and to be able to do these things. Um, and no, you don't have to commit to growth beyond IT. It was helpful in our scenario because we were helping and becoming a better partner to some of the folks at, you know, on campus who wanted to do these things. And it also helps to you know, potentially leverage if I wanna get that staffing, but you're not committing to growth beyond IT. I don't know if there's anything else there that you wanna ask Sarah, but I think it's a really good question, David, and it does feel like a lot. And I'm definitely one for stripping aside all of the stuff because they're constantly throwing stuff and paring it down to what does your institution need? What can you leverage um, and how to make those things happen without worrying about 400 modules? Yeah, and I, I love how you 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 were talking a lot about your scoped apps and capabilities and you know rolling out rolling out new functionality, but it really came down to looking at the process, right? Developing the roadmap around ITSM. What's the business value, right? What, why are we building this thing in the first place, right? What business value is it gonna provide? Uh, unfortunately, where our time, Sarah, are we? Uh, okay. Karen. Yeah, so we're-, we're <laughs> There was yeah. one more question. <laughs> I know, but, uh, yeah. And, and maybe uh, if, if we can send those questions as part of the recording, um, Karen, I'll, I'll, I'll send them a, a response. Um, I think we just had one other question in the queue, but uh, let me let, go ahead and wrap it up. I wanna thank you for attending today, audience. Thank you, Karen and Sarah for um, giving this presentation again. I'm sure everyone found it valuable. Uh, your, their contact information can be found on the slide deck. Um, if at the end, when we officially end the recording, uh, the presentation, you'll get a link to take a survey. I also put it in chat if you wouldn't mind giving us some feedback. Your feedback helps us to improve the quality of these events. A reminder that the record, there will be a recording. This was recorded today. It will be available on the ITSM uh, CG website within five business days. If you're looking to present, if you've got a topic that you wanna share, I'm always looking for volunteers. It's pretty easy, right? I reach out, Karen and Sarah said, yes, we wanna be heard. We wanna share our story. It's very easy to do. I'll walk you through the process. But if you have a voice, I have a stage, I say. So reach out to me. My email address can be found everywhere. Maybe not in the bathroom, but it can be found everywhere. Uh, so please contact me and I can help you set up a, a time to to uh, do, do a presentation. So thank you, everyone. Have a great day and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.